I feel like our best days are, in fact, ahead of us, even though the challenges we have are enormous. For me, this is more about what the future of our democracy can look like, not so much who's currently there. Oh, it's beautiful. Dow Constantine is running for a fourth term as King County Executive to continue fighting for racial justice, climate solutions, and public health. It's time for us to fight for what we believe in. Joe Wen is a Washington state senator who is running what he calls an audacious challenge to the status quo. We can't afford to tax poor people anymore. The stage is set for a showdown between two progressive lawmakers. I've been the transit leader in this region. The race for King County Executive, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. For the first time in a dozen years, there's a legitimate race for King County Executive. Dow Constantine, the incumbent, is seeking his fourth term after running essentially unopposed in 2013 and 2017. His challenger is Joe Wen, a first-term state senator with a progressive agenda who says it's time for a change. Wen's a very long shot to win but he's forced King County to have a serious debate about its future leadership this November. One, two, three. Dow Constantine has held the King County executive job since 2009 and wants to serve a fourth term to continue his work on racial justice, climate change, mobility, and more. This moment uh, where we're coming out of this uh, confluence of crises, I think presents real opportunities. Constantine, who hasn't had a real challenger in the last two elections, beat out four challengers in the August primary, earning nearly 52% of the vote. He's raised almost $1.8 million for his campaign as of early October and is endorsed by Governor Inslee and former Governors Locke and Gregoire, as well as Planned Parenthood and Washington conservation voters. There's a really significant need in our community. On the issue of homelessness, Constantine says he's worked to acquire buildings that the county can use as shelters. And he's now pushing to increase funding for behavioral health therapy for people living on the street with addiction issues or mental illness. Those underlying challenges may not be what brought someone into homelessness, but they may be a barrier to getting out of homelessness. And so that's really going to be a key over the coming uh, legislative session and in the years to come. Constantine's opponent wants to shut down the county's new youth detention facility and courthouse, which the executive has pledged to do by 2025. It's going to have to be uh, all hands on deck effort. Constantine says he's reduced the average nightly detention count from 80 when he took office to 15 per night now. But reaching zero use of detention will take more than a campaign pledge. There are some missing elements, and those missing elements are really going to involve building the capacity within the community to provide mentorship and the ability of an entire community to wrap its arms around a young person and help uh, get them back on track. Constantine is also pushing back against his challenger's plan to make public transit free and says not charging businesses who currently buy millions of dollars worth of transit passes for their workers doesn't make sense. What he's proposing is reducing service and giving the big businesses in this county a break. Uh, and that seems like not the right approach, either in terms of transportation or in terms of equity. It's time for us to fight for what we believe in. Joe Wynn is a first-term state senator from West Seattle, who says he's trying to bring some urgency to the role of county executive. I think a lot of it is because, candidly, I'm impatient. Wynn came in second in the August primary with close to 33% of the vote and has raised nearly $205,000 for his campaign as of early October. He's endorsed by the media outlets The Stranger and The Urbanist, Sage Leaders, the political arm of Puget Sound Sage, plus amalgamated transit union Local 587, and Washington State Treasurer Mike Pellicciotti. It is four to five times cheaper to keep somebody housed than it is to take them out of homelessness. Wen has criticized the county for not coming through on a pledge to end youth homelessness and says the county needs to act quickly 
to distribute rent relief funds to landlords and tenants to keep people from becoming homeless in the first place. You have to tackle this in a variety of ways to truly address the problem, but you have to turn off the spigot of those becoming homeless. Because if you don't turn it off, there's no way we're going to be able to address it as well. When the son of Vietnamese immigrants, grew up near the county's youth detention facility. We're already spending way too much money on a broken system. He wants to repurpose what he calls the youth jail and put more funding into community-based diversion programs to help young offenders at a lower cost. A $240 million jail for 15 individuals doesn't seem cost-effective. Having smaller, therapeutic, humane types of situations would actually help these kids better. And also, it's more cost-effective as well. On his free mass transit idea, Wen says if corporations did keep paying for passes for their workers, the amount the county would have to chip in to maintain service would be nominal, but could have a multifaceted impact. The crux of how do you address a lot of these issues that we're facing, whether it's climate change or homelessness or affordability, that has to be done with transit. Economic mobility is how we move forward as a county. Moving forward with a new voice or a voice with many years of experience, that's the decision ahead for voters in the race for King County Executive. I feel like our best days are, in fact, ahead of us, even though the challenges we have are enormous. We deserve better, and we need leadership who reflects that as well. And with the help of King County Television, we're happy to bring you both candidates for King County Executive. We have with us the incumbent, Dow Constantine, and the challenger, State Senator Joe Wen. Thank you both for joining me here. I'll jump right into it. We had a coin flip before the show. Senator Wen, you'll speak first here. Why are you running and what are your qualifications? First off, thank you so much. Look, I'm Senator Joe Wen, and thank you for the time as well. The reason why I'm running for this office is because I'm impatient, and I believe that we deserve better. And the old ways of doing things aren't working, and this is especially true when it comes to our response on homelessness. And it's been called different things over the years, like the 10-year plan to end homelessness or the five-year plan, now the regional approach. But it's always been under the county executive. And fundamentally, we have to do better, especially given the limited resources that we have. And the very fact that I'm running in this race shows that I'm unafraid of tackling big issues. And we cannot wait around for the status quo to solve problems that have been impacting us for decades, especially by folks who've been in office during that entire time. So right now, it's not about politics. It's about getting things done because people need our help. And that's why I'm running for King County Executive. All right, thank you very much for that. Dal Constantine, an opening statement from you, please. Well, thanks so much. I'm King County Executive Dow Constantine. When COVID hit here, the first place in the nation, I led with science and reason and we saved lives. Now vaccine verification will save even more lives and keep our recovery going. That was and is not an easy thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. I led the creation of Best Starts for Kids, the nation's most comprehensive early childhood program, led the creation of Sound Transit 3 to connect our entire region with zero carbon light rail. While others are squabbling, I am taking the concrete steps to end homelessness, buying thousands of hotels and other housing units. My administration has repeatedly set the pace in financial stewardship, environmental restoration, animal welfare, er, uh, equity and social justice, and much more. Exiting this time of crisis is an incredible opportunity, a chance to recast the assumptions about what's possible to advance more quickly toward the true north they set forth for the county, making this a welcoming community where every person can thrive. Okay, thank you very much for that. And let's dive into that issue of homelessness. Dal, let me start with you. So we're talking about the Regional Homelessness Authority, the county's new response to our homelessness crisis. It's had some challenges. The pandemic delayed the launch of the RHA. Plus with this regional approach, some cities didn't wanna be involved. There's been a big pushback from places like Redmond where people say, we don't wanna have a hotel for homeless people here. I wanna talk about this, the county's response to homelessness during your time in office and what it's gonna look like if you're reelected. Well, yes, I did lead the creation of the Regional Homelessness Authority to bring together Seattle and King County, offer a seat at the table, not only to the other cities, but to those with lived experience so we can have a holistic and effective response for emergency services for those who are on the street. But separate, separate from that, I've started my Health Through Housing initiative, pushing some $350 million out to buy the units to move people out of chronic homelessness with the services to stay housed. It is an exciting moment where we have a chance to turn the tide on homelessness. You may have seen last week, I stood up our uh, new jobs program where we're hiring some 400 formerly homeless and unemployed people to help uh, clean up our parks, clean up our streets and put our region back together the way we want it. We are taking a comprehensive approach, including 
24-7 uh, uh, behavioral health teams on the streets to engage those folks who need help to get them inside, get them the support that they need to avoid conflicts with other residents or with the police. Uh, this is uh, the kind of concrete work that needs to happen here. And although we've seen dysfunction in other governments, uh, we really at King County, as in other areas, are leading the way with real results. Dal, let me follow up with that one piece, though. When cities do push back, I brought up the Redmond example and the Silver Cloud Hotel that's out there. Not a lot of people are excited about having that in, in, in the community. They're not happy about it at all. What do you tell those residents out there? Well, first off, uh, we worked with the city of Redmond to identify uh, a hotel to purchase, and we're working with them to get the right provider in that hotel mm -hmm. to provide the services. But uh, it is a fact that whether we're in Redmond or Federal Way, Auburn, Seattle, or Shoreline, Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want to have homeless people on the streets, and I don't hear from anybody who does want to have homeless people on the streets, mm -hmm. you have to provide an appropriate place for them to be able to go and to live. Yeah. This is something we're going to share a challenge across the entire county, and it is easy to criticize. It is easy to sit back, as my opponent does, and say, why haven't you solved this problem? But we're bringing forward real solutions, and those solutions are not always easy. Not everyone's happy with them but it's what okay. you have to do if you're a leader. Fair enough. Uh, Joel, I'll have you weigh on this topic. Uh, no, no, that's interesting. Sitting there. back yeah, is not right quite ahead. what I would probably describe the work that we've been doing tirelessly okay. over the past few years in the legislature and otherwise as well. And that's kind of a good point that he brought up, that they bought these hotels. But what's interesting is that's fundamentally part of the problem in the sense that you have to staff these hotels to be able to actually open as well. So we've been doing things just not very well. Also, rent relief, getting hundreds of millions of dollars in rent relief from the federal government and not being able to send them out in a timely manner is part of the problem. And it's funny that the incumbent had also said that he'd been working with the local jurisdictions on this because I've had some private conversations with many folks representing these jurisdictions, including folks in Redmond who had a meeting until midnight last night with the mm -hmm. community members that felt blindsided by some of these decisions. And that's also a systemic thing that we face across other jurisdictions. It's not about top-down leadership. It's about building a coalition of folks to address this problem. The reason why we haven't been able to do it over all of these years, while the incumbent's been in office for the past 25 years, 12 years in this space, is because we need leadership who's gonna to work together with the community to get these things done. So that's part of the problem as well. Okay, I, I wanna make sure I follow up on this piece though, Joe. Yeah. How do you get that community buy-in? We're talking about a job here that's very difficult in a lot of these smaller cities here. How do you change the dynamic on that? Because this isn't something that's gonna change overnight. You show up and listen, even when mm -hmm. the cameras aren't on. You have to be okay. in the community meetings, you have to be engaged, and you have to do things authentically. It's one thing to be able to come down when there are press conferences or photo mm -hmm. ops. It's another to actually engage in authentic conversations when times are tough as well. And to also stick your neck out on the line when some of these things happen. So I do know that okay. some of the council members involved in a few of these places are very progressive and want to have these resources here, but did not feel supported in the terms in, in terms of how this came about in the first place. That's okay. one of the things. And, and like okay. candidly, it's more of just a trust issue as a whole for us mm -hmm. to move forward. And the fact that we've been doing kind of the same stuff for the last 12 years is a testament to kind of the need for change as well. Okay, I, Joe, I, thank you for that. And Dow, I don't know if you wanna respond yeah, to that sure. piece. I know uh, I heard a piece about the I, eviction I would like to. and rent relief things, too, sir. so go ahead, yeah. First off, uh, every hotel that's being purchased is being purchased uh, with the consent and the guidance of the city governments of those cities. Uh, second of all, uh, it is pretty rich for uh, my challenger to be talking about uh, making progress on homelessness when he has done effectively nothing uh, to provide leadership in the state legislature on this or the other issues about which he is critical. Third, on rent relief, uh, every major jurisdiction in this country had significant challenges getting the federal rent relief out under the old rules, but within 24 hours, of the issuance of the new treasury guidance, we implemented it and we've already pushed nearly $50 million out this year, 7.7 .7 million last week. We'll have expended all the rent relief we've received from the federal government by the end of this month. We are creating a real success story here. I, just, I wanna make sure that I go back to you, Joe, on a few things there, but just to follow up on that piece, Dow, do you feel confident that all that money is gonna be out there by the end of October, that by November 1st, we're going to have these Landlords, these renters who have been in a tough spot over the past couple of months here, even a year plus, are they going to be able to pay the rent? Yes, we've uh, pulled several dozen employees from other parts of the county to process the thousands of applications that have come in. We're reaching out to the landlords and the tenants to get their verification of their status. 
the technology system is up running and working and uh, what we want now is more money to arrive from the federal government so that we can continue this service through the end of the year. Got it. Joe, I wanted to make sure I gave you a chance to talk about this. I know you had some criticisms about the technology, just the urgency behind the rent relief effort. Any last words on this before we move to another topic? Well, no, I also think it's interesting to, to talk about not necessarily having leadership at the legislative level in the sense that we've funded basic needs programs like we've not done before, rent relief being part of that for the state overall as well, and also trying to tackle some of the root causes as it relates to homelessness in general. I think the problem is we're not looking at it from a perspective that is holistic that will actually give us long-term uh, benefits in the sense of how do we truly solve this issue. So if the incumbent hasn't been able to see some of the work that has been done at the legislature, I'd be happy to, to talk them through it. Okay. I, I know there's a lot more to this issue, but I do want to move on. And Joe, let me stick with you if I could here, because you've had some issue with the Children and Family Justice Center, which some call the youth jail here in Seattle. Voters approved building it in 2012, but there have been a lot of efforts to reduce youth incarceration and shut it down ever since. The county has a goal for zero youth detention, closing this facility by 2025. But I know you want to you want that to happen a lot faster. But I want to know how you'll do that, because here and now we've got a big gun violence program uh, problem, I should say, in Seattle and in King County. You got neighbors saying in some cases there are some young people who need to be in custody as a matter of public safety. They need to be locked up. How do you respond to that? Yeah, you have to look at it from a different perspective, too. Locking somebody up isn't always going to be the answer. More punishment doesn't help people giving them therapeutic support is what does it. So if you look at the number of individuals who are there right now, there's about 15 to 25 on any given night. We certainly have enough resources to have community-based solutions that can actually help defer these youths into a more therapeutic and helpful way by having a special assessment based off of their particular needs. One of my first bills allowed for the county to actually start up some of these programs as well to be able to show that there's other opportunities that can help these individuals. So for me, it's smaller community-based facilities, that are tailored to the needs of these individuals, but also investing in our youths as well, making sure that we have arts programs, that we have diversion programs, that we have after school programs so that we can try to get these kids off of the streets into something that is more beneficial. The solutions are actually there. These are the same solutions that I've been talking about when uh, community organizers were against this deal in the first place. And that's what they've implemented afterwards. And we can certainly make more investments in that space. Okay, uh, now I wanna make sure I get your reaction to what Joe's saying and more on your plan for closing the youth detention center in four years. And also if you could answer that question about youths who might be at a high risk to reoffend, because I know there's some people in the community that wanna know about that too. Well, during my time in office, we've been able to reduce the number of uh, people in detention charged as youth from about 80 on average to fewer than 15. In fact, often fewer than 10 per night now. Mm -hmm. We did that through diversion. We did that through prevention. We did it through hard work, hard sustained work over time. Uh, my opponent's spouting of uh, rhetoric and slogans does not do the hard work. The hard work would have been for him to in introduce a bill uh, removing the requirement that counties actually have a juvenile detention facility if he didn't want us to have one. He's been in the legislature not quite three quarters of one legislative term now, but he has yet to introduce any bill that would uh, remove that responsibility from us, nor bills to uh, eliminate the crimes for which these kids are charged. The fact is that there are the most complex cases still in detention. Okay. And we need I, a whole community solution to be able to uh, complete our goal that I agreed to with Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County, to close centralized detention by 2025. Well, that's the interesting point is that the incumbent has actually said that he wanted to close the youth jail. So what's, what's changed then if he's not able to, to do that without state statute? Also, just a reminder, I paid for the incumbent when he was in the legislature. So he's been in office for about 25 years at this point. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it now seems to be an issue when it became politically inconvenient, right? So you could have done this before as well, especially during the time that this was being debated. So okay. let's do it. If you, I'll work with you uh, next year in whatever capacity to make sure that that is no longer an issue then. As okay. I say, reduced youth detention from 80 per night to fewer than 15. That, that is okay. the real hard work of governing. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Dow, I want to stick with you with another criminal justice issue. Our Superior Court, as you know, has a huge backload of cases in the many thousands there, tens of thousands. Critics are saying not enough money has been allocated to the Supreme Court, get this, or Superior Court, I should say, to get things back on track. Your response to that? Well, we increased funding by millions of dollars to begin moving the backlog through. The fact is that we are also simultaneously investing in alternatives 
to detention uh, for youth and adults. Um, started a program this last year to divert some 600 youth entirely from the system to keep them out of the criminal legal system and into services that can help deal with their underlying challenges and get them back on track. A similar program that I worked on with the prosecutor and the defender for adults. So it is not only the track of uh, prosecuting people in the traditional fashion, it is also finding ways to prevent and divert people from the system. Ultimately, that is the only way we're going to uh, uh, reverse this, this challenge of repeat offenders, people who come back to yep. jail over and over again with no reduction in crime. Uh, the court system is overburdened, as are yep. all of our systems. The state has a terrible, terrible revenue system, the worst in the United States. Right. Marginal progress was made this past session but we need a lot more from our state legislature. Does the does the Superior Court have enough money to do its job, Dow, is the question I'm trying to ask. No, there there okay. is no agency in the criminal legal system or most of our other systems that has enough funding. The public defender, the, uh, the uh, prosecutor, uh, all of these are underfunded, but the thing that really needs funding, because remember, the criminal legal system is an yeah. unfunded mandate from the state that takes okay. up most of our general fund. What we need is funding from the state for the alternatives and the prevention okay. that will help us reduce the use of the criminal legal system. Joe, I'm hearing a lot about the state brought up here again in alternatives. No, it's interesting. I want to make right? sure so I talked about this. Yeah, fire away. had previously been in the legislature, it sounds like he's making a good case to go back to the legislature as well. I think a part of the problem is that if you look at the jails, they're one of the largest providers of mental health services in Washington state, especially in the county. That fundamentally is part of the problem. If you wait for somebody to enter our legal system before they can get help, that is an issue. We should have been investing in those services in advance, behavioral mental health services at the county level to be able to divert some of these programs in the first place. These are all things that have happened before the pandemic. And, um, and I'm just agreeing because I think we're both on the same page in this front as well. But that's okay. part of the problem is that if we keep investing on the back end in a broken system, we're not gonna solve this. We have okay. to shift some of those resources to get them up front as well. Okay, I, I think we're talking about some of the same issues there. So I wanted to move on to one last law enforcement issue if I could. And Joe, I'll start with you here. Some ideas as to what candidate might be best for the sheriff's job. This is going to be something that will be appointed by the county executive here uh, before the end of this year. How would you approach the job of picking a new sheriff if you were elected county executive? One of the biggest things that we have to find somebody who sees themselves as a guardian and not necessarily a warrior. And there was a recent study actually commissioned by the Seattle Police Department that showed that the vast majority of responses that law enforcement takes are non-criminal. Don't necessarily need somebody with a gun to be able to go there. I right. believe we need to rethink how we, how we look at public safety to ensure that the community and law enforcement are both safe, having a different tiered system. So not every single response is a person with a gun. So basically the requirement that I would have for somebody in that space is somebody willing to rethink what that could look like, including it doesn't necessarily need to be a law enforcement official to be a sheriff as well. I think we really have to open up the nets in terms of what is the best candidate for this decision. Okay, got it. Uh, Dow, your thoughts on this? This is a decision you have to make within a matter of months here. I know you recently got some criteria from the community that will guide you in this decision here. Uh, your thoughts on this after voters approved this charter measure last year to make sure that the county executive picks the new sheriff here. You heard what Joe was saying. Does it need to be a law enforcement official or are your thoughts about this decision? Well, I, I appreciate the voters placing their trust in me to bring more accountability to policing, but we convened a community-wide uh, uh, steering group to really talk through what they wanted to see in a new sheriff and what the duties and structure of the sheriff's office should be. I included uh, people from over-policed communities, those who, been the victims of state violence, as well as uh, representatives of law enforcement themselves. And they've come up with a set of recommendations now that I'm gonna have a chance to read through, digest and respond to. It is certainly possible for someone who's not a police officer to uh, lead an agency. It is also important to recognize that that person needs to be able to lead the agency. They need to understand how to help uh, the rank and file uh, change the way they do business to mm -hmm. conform more to the community's expectations in 2021. I think we have the ability in King County to really lead the nation in this, to make our values real in the work we're doing in policing and, and throughout our government. And uh, I'm eager for the opportunity come January 1st to put that in action. Would you potentially choose someone who is not a law enforcement official? Yeah, I'm not ruling that out. I know that there will be some consternation among the, the rank and file officers and mm -hmm. members of the community. Sure. But we will consider, uh, we will not, we will not uh, categorically rule out people 
who are not uh, officers. Thank you very much for that. Joe, I want to move to you and talk about transit. You have an idea to make public transit free in King County. Explain how you would pay for this and what impact you think it could make. Yeah, what's interesting is that if you look at fares, it's a large, it's a smaller percentage of the overall cost of transit as a whole. And for me, transit is kind of the foundation by which we can move the county forward on a number of levels. If you look at climate change, having more access to transit means less folks on the road. So we can decongest our roads by getting more people into transit. If we build affordable housing and transit spines, we can have more affordable housing, but also be doing it in a way that lowers the emissions from these buildings itself as well. So for me, free transit isn't so much about transit itself. It's about how do we envision a King County that is inclusive, that has economic mobility, that can also lower the emissions and impacts of climate change. So less than 15% of the fares, uh, I'm sorry, less than 50% of the revenue comes from fares. The vast majority of that comes from corporations that actually are paying for their for their employees to go. Okay. So the amount that an individual pays, pretty small actually. Okay. So if we're able to cover that amount, we can get more people into transit, build more infrastructure associated with it, and then have a transit benefit district in partnerships with these large corporations to figure out how to cover the difference or figure out a better path forward. But I do think that having access to transit means economic mobility, means uh, equity, and it means being able to address systemically our, our uh, climate change implications as well. Uh, before I let Dow jump in here, I just wanna ask, you think corporations would be okay with that? They pay the share and the rest of the public does not? Any thoughts on that? Well, they I mean, they're an investment too, right? So these same mm -hmm. corporations need our roads, want to have it be decongested, but also okay. relies on the infrastructure for their continued success. Okay. So I think that they would. And in fact, I've had some quiet conversations behind the scenes about ways that we can potentially fund some of these things as well. Okay. So okay. even if you look at the Biden infrastructure plan, mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos was one of the first people to actually say, hey, that's not a bad idea. I'm willing to pay more taxes as long as it goes to certain things. So okay. if this is a true conversation with our folks in the business community, I think it can make it happen. Okay. He's going to say your thoughts on this. Uh, authority uh, you, you, to be able to do oh, this. Sorry, uh, Joe, please important. finish that up. Yeah, so okay. the incumbent is going to say that we need state authority to do this, but we also need a vision and leadership to make it happen. So I do think that unless we have these conversations now, it's never going to happen. Okay, all right. Here's the conversation between the county and the state right here. Dow, you've worked in the transit field for many years here. I wanted yes. to talk about that. What do you think of the idea of providing free transit? Well, uh, first off, I built up Metro Transit to be named just a couple of years ago, the best large transit agency in North America, even while uh, leading the creation of Sound Transit 3. I've been the transit leader in this region. And one of the ways in which we led was creating more access to transit by creating a low income uh, fare car, the Orca Lift, and a very low income fare car that's free so that people can pay what they can afford and be able to have access to transit. My opponent, uh, not really understanding the situation, came in and demanded free transit. That takes hundreds of millions of dollars out of transit with no revenue to replace it. That means cutting routes, cutting mobility for people who are dependent on transit. And most of that money is in fact paid by corporations, by employers. Uh, it is uh, really uh, just a perfect example of not understanding what it is that you don't understand because you didn't understand how transit was funded uh, made what sounded like an attractive proposal is now having to backtrack and say, oh, well, maybe we can come up with something where the business is paid and no one else does. Okay, uh, Joe, that's I want to make sure I give you a second for rebuttal, please. I mean, yeah. that's, again, part of the problem, career politician trying to make themselves look better over the time. So, look, I told you how much it's going to cost. I also said how we're going to be able to fund it as well and requiring the vision to actually move forward because the city of Seattle just did this for uh, students Right. Mm -hmm. Like we're already seeing this happening in other places. This is not some wild idea. We're seeing other jurisdictions doing this already as well. So have you have you introduced all the time Olympia to do some this, of these Joe. issues or we can work towards figuring out what that might look like in the future. So that's up to you. Have you okay. ever introduced a bill to do this in Olympia? In your three have sessions you done it? in the Senate? Thank you. No. OK. No. OK. All right. Uh, thank you for the back and forth on this. I appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of talk about transit at the state and county level over the next bit here. Uh, Joe, I wanted to go back to you to talk about an issue I know is important to you, trying to find some new sources of revenue. You've talked about a wealth tax before, possibly at the county level. Could you explain what that is, why it's needed, and the impact you think it would have on us? Yeah, no, not at the county level. I think it would have to be done at the state level and okay. then pass through, through the county and local jurisdictions right now okay. as well. So like we've mentioned before, progressive revenue is one of the most important things that our state faces because of our regressive tax structure. One of us has talked about it for a long time. One of us has actually implemented some of these things in the legislature over the past few years. 
So the biggest thing is making sure that we have an opportunity so that everybody benefits. The problem with our regressive structure right now is that when we're trying to raise revenue for either transit or alleviating homelessness, we rely on the same things, property taxes, sales taxes, car tabs. So what ends up happening is that when we're trying to help people who are most on the margins, we end up pushing them closer to the margins because of our regressive nature of the taxation system. So when people say, you know, have a wealth tax, it's because we can't afford to tax poor people anymore because that's who we're trying to help. So we've worked on capital gains, helping pass that to the state. We've actually lowered tax liabilities through the working families tax exemption and even a progressive REIT as well to lower the implications of that for a lot of people. So to me, it's twofold conversations. How do we raise enough revenue, but how do we lower the burden on the folks being impacted right now? Okay. The wealth uh, taxes, Dow, proposal, there's other ones as well that's out there. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dow, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the wealth tax while we we're talking about this issue. Good idea, what do you think of it? Yeah, taxes should be based on what you have and what you earn. And uh, what happens in this state is almost the exact opposite of that. Uh, so those who make the least and have the least pay the biggest proportion of their resources in taxes. Uh, this needs to be fixed. It has been a long-term challenge in the state. I applaud the legislature for moving forward with these reforms, but uh, we are just at the very beginning of what would be a long and difficult journey. That's why I authored the state uh, tax study uh, commission in uh, when I was in the state Senate. And that led ultimately to uh, what was an unsuccessful attempt to create a state income tax on the ballot a few years back. Uh, we need to move this conversation forward. It would benefit our state enormously. This economy can support all of the infrastructure and all the services that people need to be able to live successful lives without anyone breaking a sweat if everyone pays their fair share. Uh, just a challenge with that and dealing with these larger companies though, Dow, I know you've heard some of the pushback mm -hmm. of those larger levels. How do you get that buy-in from companies who might not be too sure about this? This is the start of an income tax, things of that level. Can you answer those concerns? Well, you gotta, you gotta recognize that this is in comparison to the other 49 states and our system is the most regressive mm -hmm. of those 49 states. We could adopt any of those systems and have a tax system that is more progressive, that is better for those who make the least. So those corporations are going to have to compare against those other state systems too. Okay. And then to go off of that a little bit, you'd be Please. surprised at how receptive they might be simply because they themselves are already paying with DNO and other uh, potential mm -hmm. revenue That's streams right. as well. So in order to have a more balanced tax structure, they certainly have to be at the conversation, at the table for the conversation. Um, yeah. And they have been, I serve on the tax structure work group right now, as we've been talking to folks throughout the entire state. Uh, so a lot of folks that you'd be surprised are engaged who I did not think would necessarily be. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I know there's a lot of work ahead on that issue too. We're getting towards the end of the show here, and I'd like for both of you to touch on something that maybe we haven't discussed here. Dow, an issue that's important to you that might not get as many headlines. What else about your campaign, what you've been working on, do you want to let voters know about before we get to the closing statements here? Well, I'm really proud of the work we've been doing on the economic side of COVID recovery, the social mm -hmm. side of COVID recovery. We put together a uh, 600 plus million dollar aid package and it's helping uh, businesses get rolling again, helping uh, those who are most impacted like um, black and Latino owned businesses be able to get back on their feet, helping our arts and cultural community that was the first to close and the last to reopen to rehire tens of thousands of people. and keep the cultural life of our community functioning. These are the things you need to do in order for us to be able to uh, zoom ahead, accelerate ahead economically, and we need to be able to keep this economic recovery going. That's why I've taken the difficult uh, step of creating this vaccine mandate, because okay. uh, without it, we are in grave danger of having to go backwards, close businesses and close schools. Got it. Uh, Joe, if you could, uh question to you here another issue you want people to know about your campaign before we get to closing statements here yeah you know what's interesting is that the county is the 12th largest in the entire nation bigger than 14 states yet we don't have an office of economic development so for us to have a pandemic recovery that is in fact just we need to have a dedicated stream of folks actually working in that space the other one too is for us to really address, say, for instance, gun violence or even helping youth through our legal system, we need more community centers, more opportunities for youth to be engaged. There's also not an office that is in charge of helping with facilitating, say, for instance, community centers. But really, I think the most important thing about this race is that people who now, for the first time, feel as if they have a voice in this system, people who are impacted by policies are now being heard 
and being able to have a place to channel those frustrations as well. I feel the conversations from folks in the community, from folks at the county who felt that they've been ignored for so long. And being able to have these thoughtful conversations and debates, I know that it can be contentious sometimes, but I actually appreciate them is because we should be raising these issues to the forefront. So my biggest thing on this is people who've been impacted by policies who've been left out are now going to be front and center in these conversations. Yeah. And another issue I'm remiss in not bringing it up until now, but talking about climate change in our region and what you're going to do about it. Adal, I want you to start on this. If you could talk about what the county is doing right now, trying to get to that vision where we're carbon free after a certain amount of years. But let's talk about that, what you're doing, what we're going to see in the future, potentially, yeah. if you're reelected. Well, I hope you saw the grand opening of Northgate Link, the new light rail line with three new stations. I have really put my effort into creating a region-wide three-county high-capacity transit system, okay. and we are succeeding in that. That is an enormous step along with the full electrification of the Metro bus fleet that will move us toward uh, decarbonizing the, the transportation system. Uh, you may have seen a couple of weeks ago, I announced our green building codes, which eliminate yeah. fossil fuels for the heating and cooling of buildings, commercial buildings and multifamily and the unincorporated area. We're yeah. a national leader. We've been recognized for that work. And I'm really proud of the fact that we are taking our ideals and putting them into action to uh, help turn the tide on the climate uh, crisis. Joe, any thoughts on this climate change and green energy? Yeah, I, I know think it's climate an issue change should be on the too. forefront, right? And look, it's the I've I really enjoyed reading reports, and the county has put out numerous reports around climate and set targets that they have been not been able to meet. Um, but if you look at the county, that's actually the most opportune space for us to address a lot of these issues. When we talk about the Growth Management Act, even how we use land use, that impacts climate change. The reason why I'm so aggressive about transit is because that's a way to impact and alleviate the impacts of climate change. Affordability, where we build and how we build, like the executive has said, impacts climate change. So doing this all in tandem, and it can't be one off and it can't be just one report, it has to be implemented and it has to be thoughtful as well. So I, I think the, the county is well positioned to be in this space and just needs leaderships that reflects that value as well. Okay, all right, thank you very much for that. Well, it is closing statement time and I thank you both for joining me here, but uh, Joe, I'm gonna give you the, the first crack at this, a closing statement. I'll give you about a minute or so if you want to close out, please. Yeah, no, I'll be brief. Look, I believe that politics is about people and not careers. And right now we need leaders who are willing to engage and willing to do the work and willing to do it different because the status quo hasn't worked for us. So my experience, not just as a state senator, but in the private sector and also my lived experience as a person from South King County, I believe make me uniquely qualified for this role. So honestly, thank you so much for the time and opportunity to have this discussion. And I'm yeah. looking forward to talking more as well. All right, uh, Dow, I'll give you the last word here, please. Well, thanks so much. And I'm glad we're closing out because I just saw my little girl run by, uh, having gotten home from school. She's a second grader now, uh, growing up fast. And it uh, it does sound trite, but it, it makes everything that we're doing seem just a little more urgent, uh, whether it's climate or equity and social justice. Uh, the world we leave her and Joe's kids and, and everyone is probably our most important charge. I am so grateful to the people of King County for giving me such a strong endorsement in the primary. I won in all 17 of King County's legislative districts by handy margin, including my home district, which is also my opponent's home district here in the 34th. Uh, the people know that we are the ones who are bringing clear, effective leadership to a region that has some real challenges and has some pretty challenging politics. Uh, and we're going to need that clarity moving forward because the challenges uh, will continue to come, like COVID. Uh, the fact that we were able to create the nation's best response to the COVID crisis is one indication of why we need to continue our leadership. All right, thank you very much for that. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the race for King County Executive? One writes, I'm sticking with Dow Constantine. There aren't enough policy differences to slide a piece of paper through. Constantine is effective. Another comments, after 12 years of the status quo in King County, it's time for transformative change and proactive leadership. Vote Joe Wen. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram. We want to thank our partners at King County TV for collaborating on the special edition of City Inside Out. Coming up next time, our election coverage continues with a journalist roundtable. We'll get the scoop on the key city and county races before you cast your ballot. 
That's on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us.